We've now reached the final session on 1 Chronicles, but I'd actually like to start with a verse from Psalm 84. Verse 10 reads, I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell among the wicked. 1 Chronicles chapter 26 devotes 19 verses to the names and duties of the gatekeepers in the house of the Lord. They are listed as being able men, very capable, qualified for this position. Prophets were spiritual watchmen, guarding the souls of God's people, and the gatekeepers were physical watchmen, protecting the temple and ensuring that those who wanted to enter were ready to serve and worship God. There were four main entrances to the temple. The gatekeepers opened the gates, but they were also responsible for ensuring that the utensils used in the services were clean, that the food supplies were stored carefully, and that the furniture was in good repair and cleaned. They also mixed the incense and received and counted all the gifts that were brought to the temple, so they bore a lot of responsibility. Amongst the gatekeepers were the sons of Obadidim. We first encountered him back in chapter 13 when the Ark of the Covenant stayed in his house for three months and he was greatly blessed. Here we see what part of that blessing was. Eight sons and more grandsons rose to positions of high authority. What a blessing to see descendants serving the Lord. A few little pointers from this chapter. These verses reveal to us that every area of service is vital and esteemed highly by God. We don't need to covet or envy others' positions, but just serve faithfully where God places us. There's a great verse in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 that reiterates this point. Whether we're called to guard duty or to look after the king's treasury or to serve in administration or any other area of service, let's do it all to the glory of God. Again, in verse 13, we see that positions were assigned by lot, not by age or status or anything else. God always desires our heart, not our standing in the world. In verse 32, we see that some of the Levites related to Jeriah of the clan of Hebron were sent out as emissaries or ambassadors. Numbers 26 verse 58 assures us that the Hebronites are a sub-clan of the Levites. They weren't only responsible for the spiritual oversight, but also for the laws of the Lord and of the king. Therefore, of necessity, they became judges too. Once the important task of organising the tribe of Levi is complete, David starts to organise the military. So chapter 27 lists the various army divisions who were required to be ready to go to war, to keep the peace in the land and to serve in the army from age 20 onwards. In David's army, there were 12 divisions and each division consisted of 24,000 men and each division could therefore serve for one month every year. And if war broke out, other divisions could be called up to serve. Now, we are God's army and should be ready in season and out of season to serve. Isn't it great that David also realised the need for an elite military group as well? The SAS of his day were the mighty men or the 30. These men sometimes acted as David's personal bodyguard and sometimes were sent out on special missions. Two particular men stand out in this group. Benaiah was their leader. He was a hero in Israel. He killed two mighty warriors from Moab a lion in a pit on a snowy day, and a seven-foot Egyptian. He also defended Solomon's right to be king by killing those that opposed Solomon. Azahel, in verse 7, was killed by a man called Abner who headed up Ishbosheth's army. Ishbosheth was Saul's son and tried to take the throne after Saul had died before David was crowned. And we then get into politics in verses 16 to 22. These tribal leaders were not priests or military leaders, but administrators in the civil service of the kingdom of Israel. Did you notice verses 23 and 24? Back in chapter 21, we learned about a census that David took against the will of God. Job spoke up against it then, but was nevertheless a man under the authority of his king. So he began the census. Now we discover it was never completed. This is another reminder that we should put our trust in God and not in numbers or possessions. We do not need to count on the wrong thing when we can count on God. There's then a list of officials who were put in charge of various areas, overseeing David's treasury, fields, vineyards and herds. Looking after the agricultural aspects of the country was vital for the welfare of the nation. Without food, the people would starve. Note that they oversaw David's property. They didn't regard it as their own. In the same way, we should look after the giftings and talents that the Lord has entrusted to us and ensure we use them wisely for the glory of God. God knows what our areas of expertise are. We see that in the appointing of Obil, the Ishmaelite, an Arab, to look after camels. And just as the Hagrite, a shepherd tribe, 
to look after the flocks. He places us in positions for which we are best qualified. The chapter concludes by mentioning some of David's personal advisers. Like David, we all need people around us to help advise and guide us, with whom we can pray, but who will also challenge us, because iron sharpens iron. These were real men with personal challenges of their own. Joab was fiercely loyal to David, but at times he was also ruthless in furthering his own position, relying on his own judgment and not always submitting to authority. You can learn more about him if you read 2 Samuel chapters 3, 18 and 20. Ahithophel was Bathsheba's grandfather as well as David's advisor, and after David had committed adultery and dispensed Uriah on the battlefield, Ahithophel allowed his anger to fester and ended up turning against David. He came to an unfortunate end. There are three main features of David's rule that can be seen in this chapter. Royal wisdom. David secured the safety of his kingdom and appointed overseers, showing that he knew the importance of delegation. Royal kindness. He appointed men to positions that suited their skill sets and remembered and showed favour toward family members. Joab, Asahel and Jonathan were all relatives. And royal sin. He took a census and refused to listen to Joab's advice with consequences for the whole nation. David is now getting old and doddery and ready to pass the baton on to Solomon. So in chapter 28, he publicly declares that Solomon is his successor so that there is no doubt. Note that verse 2 tells us that David had devoted himself. It was his heart's desire to build the temple. What's in your heart? What we give our hearts to determines how we spend our time and our money. It defines what we are willing to sacrifice. David made the necessary preparations. What are you preparing to build for God and how are you going about that? In verses 8 to 10, David exhorts all the people to stay loyal to God. He told them to be careful to obey all the commands of God. When we are followers of the Lord, we can't pick and choose which bits to obey and which to leave alone. We can't be lukewarm. We need to be on fire for the kingdom of God, following him wholeheartedly. Verse 20 echoes Joshua chapter 1. There comes a point where we can't just talk about something. We actually have to get up and do something. But at that point, we need to remember that it is God who strengthens us and helps us accomplish the task he has given us to do. Note that Solomon wasn't alone in this task. David had already prepared the leaders and workmen to help him. We all need others if we're to succeed in building for God. The final chapter of 1 Chronicles reveals to us that David gave about two and a half billion pounds worth of gold alone from his personal fortune. And that was given before the people brought their offerings. No wonder Solomon's temple was one of the wonders of the world. And remember, that was just the gold. Calculating the value of all the other materials means the investment is beyond us and all for the glory of God. And did you notice that the people gave joyfully? God loves a cheerful giver. Joy isn't found in having and hoarding, but in sacrificing and giving generously, not because we have to, but because we delight to. David really did all the donkey work for this project. He amassed the materials, ensured there was peace in the land so that no wars would interrupt the building work, and purchased the threshing floor where the temple would be built, as well as organising the workforce and drawing up the blueprints. I guess the nearest modern day equivalent that I know of would be La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. Its designer, Gaudi, who deeply loved God, died in 1926, but the building work is still ongoing using his plans and every aspect points to the love of God, the Bible and the work of Jesus on the cross. So literally all Solomon has to do is build the temple for God. And then we have David's amazing prayer of praise from which we learn three truths that help David and the people to be so generous. Number one, David understood that everything comes from God and that we are simply stewards of what he gives us. Number two, David understood the honour and privilege of giving to God's work. And number three, David understood that giving needs to come from a willing heart. Giving breaks our dependence upon material things and helps free up our hearts to see God and worship him in deeper measure. The chapter and the book ends with a great celebration and Solomon is then crowned king for the second time. The first time had been a bit of a rushed affair because Adonijah was threatening to make himself king, so this time it was done properly. And so 
we come to the end of David's reign. This man, who was born a peasant and raised to become a hero, a warrior, a king, a saint, and an example to us all. I hope you have enjoyed this series on One Chronicles. Again, I haven't been able to cover everything that can be discovered in these pages, and I would love to hear from you if you discover more gems. God bless.